I am delighted to have the opportunity to be speaking to you at the start of this conference. The short presentation I'm about to give you is based on my two books, Physical Literacy Throughout the Life Course, 2010, and Physical Literacy Across the World, 2019. These are essential reading for those who are interested to learn more. Tom has access to a discount leaflet for those attending the conference. Another way to learn more is to join IPLA, our website. There's a range of literature, blogs, articles that can further enhance your understanding of the concept. We also have a conference which spans the world taking place on October the 23rd. You see the website and if you're a member of IPLA, the conference is free. Now, Tom asked me to provide answers to a number of questions. So the first question was, why is physical literacy relevant and important? Physical literacy is relevant and important as it makes a significant contribution to a balanced life. It respects our human nature as moving beings and plays a central part in holistic well-being. Physical literacy is about encouraging a positive disposition towards participation in physical activity throughout life. In other words, to realize the potential benefits of an active life. Physical literacy is not a state of being, but an attitude, and thus can wax and wane or fluctuate throughout life, depending on the circumstances we find ourselves in and the opportunities we are able to access. Physical literacy is specific to each individual. Each is on his or her own personal physical literacy journey, which is influenced by experiences of physical activity and how these experiences have been perceived. It is suggested that to make progress on a physical literacy journey, participants need to develop their motivation, their confidence, their physical competence, and their knowledge and understanding, such that they value physical activity and take responsibility for engaging in physical activity for life. Humans express their nature in a wide variety of ways, one of which is via their body. I actually prefer to refer to the body as our embodiment which implies that this aspect of ourselves is a moving, feeling, perceiving organ, rather than a machine to be managed by us somewhat at a distance. While developing our embodied potential is highly valuable in its own right, it also opens the door to enhancing holistic fitness, facilitating social interaction, putting us in contact with the natural world, as well as playing a deep playing a part in decreasing obesity and enhancing mental health. COVID has underlined the importance and value of physical activity. Forget for everyone, not just the elite. People have realized that physical activity is rewarding, invigorating and self-fulfilling, as well as being crucial for our holistic well-being. In being physically active, we draw on particular human resources and realize an aspect of our human nature. We become more fully human, surely a worthwhile goal. The second question that Tom asked me to have a look at asked, what is the philosophical ground of physical literacy and how can it guide practitioners? Well, unfortunately, many people think that the philosophy that underpins the concept is difficult, unacceptable, complex, and they tend to avoid it. However, if they understand simply the nature of monism, existentialism, and phenomenology, then they will see how their actions, goals, and beliefs as practitioners can be influenced to advantage by these philosophies. These views are important as, in their different ways, they throw light on the importance of our embodied nature. These were the views that inspired me to take up my research 
in physical literacy. They give unequivocal support for our work on promoting physical activity. So although they are general philosophy, they make a contribution to justifying all the background of physical literacy. So monists argue that there is no body mind split and advocate that our mental faculties rely on our embodied nature as much as our embodied capabilities rely on our cognitive abilities. The key message here is that we are a whole. Experiences always build from and feed into all aspects of ourselves. Existentialists put forward the view that we create ourselves as we interact with all of all around us. We are who we are on account of accumulation of our experiences. Any aspect of our being that actively interacts with the world is important in making us who we are. Our embodied nature plays a central part in our interaction and therefore is significant in respect of who we are. The key message here is that the richer the experiences we give participants, the greater will be the potential for an enhanced quality of life. Phenomenologists build on existentialism in that they suggest that we perceive what we perceive is always coloured by previous experiences. This is significant as it means that memories of experiences in the field of physical activity will influence future attitudes to participation. Current experiences become memories that are very influential and are embedded in future perceptions. I often say to my students, take care of the present. It soon becomes the past and has a lasting effect on the future. So it, your experiences don't just disappear, they stay with you. Very, very important to remember that. The key messages are that firstly, on account of our different life experiences, we are each at a different place on our journey. We are each unique and should be respected as thus. And secondly, this indicates that where possible, each individual should be guided in their learning in a way that matches their learning needs and development. We need to know our learner as individuals to help them along their physical literacy journey. The next topic that Tom gave me was, what does a person who is making progress on their physical literacy journey look like? Participants would exhibit progress relative to their endowment in respect of the attributes of physical literacy, the attributes. Attributes are described as symptomatic behaviors. In Whitehead 2019, I set out a longer and shorter version of what these attributes are. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the shorter version. Typically, the individual who's making progress wants to take part in physical activity, has the confidence to know that it will be rewarding. The individual moves efficiently and effectively in a wide variety of physical activities, has an awareness of movement needs and possibilities. The individual can work independently and with others and knows how to improve performance. The individual knows how physical activity can improve well-being and has the self-confidence to plan and effect a physically active lifestyle. In a sense, you could use some of these symptomatic behaviours as goals in your teaching to help them to move efficiently, to help them to be independent. So the symptomatic behaviours, they do describe an individual, but they can be used in other ways as well. And if you look through that list, you'll notice that it is true to monism. It's, it's not just about the physical, it's about the physical, the cognitive and the affective. So we have to take care of all of those in the work that we do. They all feed from each other. Now, the next question was, what does a programme look like that is designed to enable the development of physical literacy or promote the journey? 
So a program designed to foster physical literacy, whether this is in the early years, during schooling, or within adulthood and during early, old age, will all display certain characteristics. So this is very important for your work as practitioners with the participants. At all times, there is a positive, encouraging atmosphere. The atmosphere is one of celebrating progress, however small. There is a learner-centered approach. Participants are known and respected as a whole and as unique. Participants are challenged and supported in their learning in relation to their physical, affective and cognitive capabilities. Sessions are active and give plenty of time for practice and learning. There is ample time for participants to become familiar with and confident in whatever activity they're involved. It's not just a quick experience, it, has, it develops over time. You have time to become confident in the activity. As far as possible, participants have the opportunity to experience all the movement forms. So that is spelled out in both books. So it concerns with, it's concerned with the aesthetic, the competitive, a whole range. And I recommend very strongly that in the work you do with participants, they cover all movement forms. Next question was, what does a physically literate society look like? Well, that's not a particularly easy question, but um, a society that is actively promoting physical literacy would clearly value physical activity in that this area is covered well at preschool age and in schooling. So it would clearly want it to be involved um, right the way through. So they would have made plans for it to be included in schooling. The society would make provision for there to be a wide range of physical activity opportunities in the community. Opportunities that are accessible to all members of society, all members, whatever their age or endowment. The society would provide opportunities that, in a sense, invite participants to take part. There's no problem about transport or about money. They are available and it becomes part of your lifestyle that you are involved in physical activity. The society would ensure that government fiscal policies and decisions and town planning send a clear message to all members of society that physical activity is uniquely valuable and may, can make an important contribution to raising the quality of life. The next topic is what is the connection between physical literacy and human flourishing? I think there's a very close relationship and there are two chapters in the 2019 book that look at human flourishing. However, human flourishing is a slippery concept. It's subject to a variety of definitions as we spell out in the book. However, as a general rule, all would agree that it can be described as a state of well-being in which an individual is thriving optimally. Thriving optimally. Broadly, this state has two facets one being quality of life and the other being breadth of experience. And I would suggest that physical literacy can make a contribution to both facets. Looking at quality of experiences first that are part of human flourishing. One list of references references the following characteristics of experiences that make a contribution to flourishing where experiences provide happiness, health, purpose, virtue, and opportunities for close relationships with others, they can enhance the quality of life. So happiness, health, purpose, virtue, and opportunities for close relationship with others. Then there's another list that you'll find in the book. These are characteristics or constituents that describe the state of flourishing the state. And they are that the individual is experiencing autonomy, very satisfying, personal growth. If you picture physical activity and see if you think that that fits in, 
self-acceptance, self-confidence, self-belief, a purpose in life, a developed environmental mastery, a positive relationship with others, and optimism, and very importantly, vitality. So where experiences foster states of being such as these, the quality of life can be enhanced. There's a lot of work about motivation and self-realization, and these sort of concepts, autonomy, purpose in life, optimism, keep cropping up. Without going into great detail, it's not difficult to identify how physical literacy can contribute to human flourishing. For example, from the first list, physical activity can contribute to happiness and health. It can provide purpose in life and opportunities to be in contact with others. From the second list, physical activity has the potential through its very nature to foster autonomy and decision making. It can also positively influence vitality personal growth and self-acceptance. You don't have to do anything except be involved in physical activity, a range of physical activity, and a number of those aspects of human flourishing are automatically covered. Regarding breadth, other iterations about human flourishing point to the benefit of capitalising on involvement in a breadth of experiences and thus of developing a wide range of our capabilities. So they're not particularly focusing on getting all these benefits from one uh, activity, but they, they encourage people to have a broad experience. This can be rewarding and fulfilling and contribute to self-awareness and self-esteem. With physical activity or physical literacy providing the individual with a unique way of interacting with the world, this clearly signals that developing this capability adds to the breadth of experience and thus adds to human flourishing. From this brief description of some aspects of, of human flourishing, I would argue that physical literacy can be seen as a constituent element of, of human flourishing, as it represents an important element of our nature. I would also argue that human flourishing without developing our embodied potential would be the poorer. In addition to enhancing quality and quantity in respect of the constituents of human flourishing, physical literacy is very close to human flourishing in that they share very similar philosophical perspectives. They share an interest in holism, in fluent interaction with the environment and the unique nature of each individual. I believe that they go hand in hand and one of the justifications for physical literacy or participation for physical activity for life is the significant contribution it makes to human flourishing. It's good to know that physical literacy is being adopted around the world. Few countries haven't heard of it and many countries have changed decision making, have changed curriculum to adopt a physical literacy approach. There is an issue here in that different countries work from slightly different perspectives of physical literacy. Now, this is not surprising as each country will have particular philosophies, a particular history and their own cultural practices. However, I believe that the concept is sufficiently grounded in credible philosophies that it is relevant to all humans, but at the same time, is robust enough to accommodate the nature of a parent country. So there's not a very tight, close requirement. In relation to each of my contacts in many countries across the world, I ask myself three questions. Is a significant goal of the work to promote lifelong participant participation in physical activity for all? So in relation to this country, is a significant goal of all the work to promote, to promote lifelong participation for all, not just the elite, but for all. I ask myself, are the learners being treated as holistic human beings? And finally, I ask myself, are their learners being recognised as unique? So is a goal participation through life are they being treated 
as holistic and, and unique individuals. And if the answer to these questions is positive, I would judge that they are intent on fostering physical literacy. Thank you very much.